Thank you. Now, I get this out of the way. Um, I work for Amazon, but this is solely my talk. They have no representation, no guarantee. Just if anything's wrong, blame me, don't go to them. So we're gonna be talking about how you design things differently, whether you're producing one or more. If you're producing millions, be completely different design strategy and production strategy. Talk about tens or hundreds. We'll differentiate between only one or two of something, or for producing one or two on the way to a much larger quantity. And I'll be using examples from my uh, past career, some lessons learned along the way. Maybe you'll get something from that. So if you're only making a few, a good place to start is catalogs, uh, or online catalogs, right? It's not 1971 anymore. You can maybe make something from these parts in the catalogs, right? That's easy, you skip a lot of design work, and you can put something together with catalog elements, catalog mounts. You can always make a circuit board, it's never been cheaper or easier to make a circuit board. This one's interesting because it leverages an evaluation board from the sensor vendor. So that made our job simpler on this very first breadboard. Uh, we just made the blue part. The, the green boards come from the camera vendor. You can always mill or turn some metal. That works in any quantity. Uh, you can make a custom lens from stock elements. This is really successful at a large number of quantities, actually. Uh, this is what I called an alignment integrated module. It's from about 17 years ago. It includes a camera sensor, a lens, and an illumination system. So here it is in side view, and there's the optical system laid on top of it. Here's a ZMAX file. Please analyze it. No, I'm kidding. Um, the point here is all of those lenses are catalog lenses, and yet we made a really high-performing lens system from them. Uh, there's a lot of systems you can buy on the market now. They have nice custom mechanics and maybe some lighting systems, and they're actually built around catalog elements. You can get them at a huge discount if you're making them in that quantity. Diamond turning is a very interesting technique. Uh, you can use it in a very small quantity. It's, it's expensive, but it does a really good job. And you can also use it to make a mold for a large quantity, so it kind of has a foot in each place. And the beauty of it is if you use it for the mold and you use it for the prototype, the performance will be nearly identical. You can diamond turn a lot of materials, almost all of the optical polymers. Most of the metals we care about in optics and the crystals that we tend to use in IR and in lasers. What we can't do is turn glass. Phillips spent a lot of time and money in the 80s trying to hold glass on a lathe at its transition temperature. Just soft enough to diamond turn, but not so soft it fell off the chuck in a puddle. They couldn't quite ever get that just right. So we can't turn glass, we can't turn fused silica, and we can't diamond turn sapphire. So it's really good for that proof of concept quantity. I only ever make a few, and it's really good if you're gonna make a lot. Here's another little design story. Wafers have a wafer ID mark on them. This is used to track the wafer all through the process. There's wafer ID readers on all of these process pieces of equipment, so they make sure they're doing the right process to the right wafer, and they track it all the way from a bare wafer to the, just before it's diced. So in, 2003, the semi-organization threw us a bit of a curveball. Up until that point, the marks had been hard. You could see them with your eye. They were deep, they were ablated into the silicon. And that was good to see them, but there was a concern that when you ablated the silicon, you ejected a little bit of silicon and it might land on some of the devices that were gonna be made nearby on that wafer, and that could lead to some rejects. So they invented what they called a super soft mark. Instead of blasting away some silicon, they gently heated it. And surface tension pulled that little 200 micron spot of hot silicon into a shallow little puddle, a couple of microns deep. It was like a miniature F100 telescope mirror. And it was invisible. It was invisible to the eye. It was invisible to wafer readers. Uh, this is us in a lab trying to read a soft mark. And it's in that red box and we're using some really good high quality lab level dark field lighting. You can see that ball bearing, you can see the rings, the ball bearing is sitting on the machinist's rule, by the way, next to the dime. 
You can see the rings of LEDs we have beaming down on this wafer. That's a wafer edge in the red box, and we're not seeing a thing. So there's a way to make a telecentric lens, and this is actually a good technique if you can't find one that suits you. You take a nice commercial lens that has some field of view, and uh, a focal length away, you put a lens that takes those rays uh, and makes them all parallel. And that's what we call telecentric. So this was my starting point for how to read these soft marks. So what I did was, I, there's the commercial lens. Um, I put a ring of LEDs around that telecentric aperture. So we're gonna follow the light and how this goes through the system. So there's the yellow light coming from the LED. Uh, diverges, of course, till it hits that lens. Remember, that's a focal length away. So it collimates and it hits the wafer. The wafer's that gray slab on the, on the side. And then, because it's a mirror, a wafer, a polished wafer is very much like a mirror. It bounces back. That's gonna be in blue. Where they overlap, it's gonna be green, of course. So it bounces right back. Goes through an inversion, because it's coming off of a mirror, and it lands on the opposite LED. So a ring of LEDs goes through the whole system and comes back imaged onto itself. And that's cool because no light is going through the lens, so it's, it is a kind of a dark field. It doesn't look like dark field, but it is dark field. Unless there's uh, something going on in that wafer. There's a little soft mark. I made it bigger so you could see it. So I said it was like an F100 telescope, right? It was very, very shallow, long focal length uh, mirror. So it focuses the light, it goes through focus, it diverges, now it goes through that lens, and it's, because it's diverging, it doesn't get collimated or anything. It comes back through the aperture. I only showed the light here that comes through the aperture. And it gets focused by the back lens group onto the imager. So that's a really bright spot now. So we have contrast. Uh, we had a few constraints. So one of the constraints was that telecentric field lens, labeled custom lens there, the surface facing the aperture has to be concave. If it's not concave, and having a radius at least as small as that distance shown by the blue arrow, then the reflection of those rings will be minified, and they'll get through the aperture, and it'll look like this. So this was a prototype where instead of a concave surface, we had a convex surface, because it was just a catalog doublet. So we could have handled that with some software, uh, but that would consume dynamic range in the camera system, so I didn't want to do that. So we handled it optically by making that back surface concave. Uh, that meant we had to make this custom lens. We couldn't use a doublet out of the catalog. We had to make a well-corrected lens that was bent, it was concave on one side, convex on the other. And uh, that surface, because it only had one element, had to be 10th order A-sphere. With a 10th order A-sphere, so it's not spherical, it's a kind of a complex shape. We could get good correction across the field of view. Now, to make an A-sphere, there's not a lot of ways to make them, and we want to make this one in molded plastic. And the tooling was gonna be $50,000, so I didn't want to commit the company's money to that tool without testing it out. So we diamond turned a piece of plastic to that shape. And here is, uh, here's the device, two devices. The one with the yellow frame on it is a prototype. Everything there is made through kind of prototype methods. And the black rectangle in the middle, that's the diamond turned lens. We paid about $1,000 for that lens, but you know, it's a painstaking process to diamond turn something. But it was worth it before we spent $50,000. And on the right is the molded part. And it looks kind of identical, but there's a small difference. When we took our diamond, when we took our prototype with our diamond turned lens and we put a plain wafer under it with no features and jacked up the lights a little bit, we saw this, kind of a lot of artifacts. Well, with a lot of modeling, I figured out that the tooling marks on that concave surface were causing diffraction and creating this, this mess. So knowing that, when we had the mold made, it was diamond turned as well, but we had them optically polish the convex surface that, the, that made the concave surface in the plastic. And that was a simple radius, so we could optically polish it. If this had been coming from the A-sphere, 
we could not have optically polished that mold piece because that would have ruined the figure of it. Polishing is great for spheres. That's why so many lenses are, are spheres or radii. It's not a good optical shape, actually. It's a good manufacturing shape. But so we could polish that, and then when we made the lens, it ended up working quite well. So there's the soft mark that we couldn't see. And with this system, there's the soft mark just beaming out beautifully. If you look at the ball bearing, it actually looks like bright field, right? You just see a dot. While well, the ball bearing minimizes the image again, there's actually a little dark circle in the middle of that dot that you can't really see. And here's the cost. A hundred may be a little below the threshold. It depends on what you're going to sell the item for. But at $1,000 per lens, at 50, we're at parity, right? If we amortize a $50,000 50, $50, tool and making $2 lenses with it, just past 50, we hit parity. So you certainly wouldn't make any more than 50 if you're diamond turning them one at a time out of plastic. But somewhere north of 50, maybe 100, maybe that's good enough. That's only $500. Depends on what your, what your product can bear at that point, right? If your product can only bear $50, you have to make 1,000 of them. But I included it here in 1 to 100 because it certainly has the utility when you're only making a few. Here's an example of only ever making a few with diamond turning. So there's a Cupertino Electronics Company, and in, in this time period, they were making earbuds out of polished aluminum. And they wanted the aluminum to be really, really shiny. When they polished it, uh, sometimes tooling marks were left behind and it wasn't really shiny and this wasn't acceptable to the company. So they had people on the line inspecting them. And that was slow, it was expensive, but worse, some not perfectly polished parts were getting through, so they came to us to solve this. We solved a lot of problems for them. So I knew I had this system that could look at a mirror and see the tiniest deviation from being perfectly polished, right? Those soft marks were a tiny deviation from being perfectly polished on a wafer. But here I had a cylinder, but if I could make that cylinder look flat, I could use my already existing system that was great at finding these small deviations. So I did that with a conical mirror, a nice 45 degree conical mirror, and I set it up. Uh, and we didn't take pictures because this was a very secret project. So this is from the patent application for this, uh, this system. You've got that same device I had horizontally, it's vertically here, and you can see the, the rear lens group and, and the front telecentric field lens and those rays from the LEDs, and in the middle, at the bottom is that earbud, that polished aluminum earbud, then that conical mirror coming in in blue, and that let the sun wrap. And we only ever made a few of these, right? We were really fast, so this problem came to us on a Monday. By Monday afternoon, I had found someone who had diamond turned this mirror for us. So Tuesday he made the mirror and shipped it to us at the end of the day, and Wednesday we had it. Wonders of overnight shipping, right? So Wednesday we set it up and tried it. We had good earbuds and bad earbuds uh, from our client. And we ran some software to highlight the bad ones. We sent them the images, they loved it. So Thursday, we shipped them the whole system. It was all built on breadboard stuff, right? A little metal grill, one foot table, a steady rod, some clamps. This mirror bolted to the, to the you know, quarter inch drilled, one inch square kind of table. And we just shipped that to them and said, here it is, try it. So they tried it, they went, great. We want 25 of them next week. So we said, well, it's not cost engineer, that'll cost you 40 grand a piece. They went, we don't care, just send them. We have lines down in China. So we did, and uh, it was a good deal because this cost us about $1,000 a piece, and uh, we shipped 25 of them in the next two weeks. Additive manufacturing, or 3D printing is another good way to make prototype lenses, uh, usually not for imaging though. There's one company in the Netherlands, Lux Excel, that does kind of a micro ink inkjet printing to make lenses. And they're about good enough for eyeglasses, that kind of thing. So, you know, they, they may be able to help you with imaging lenses, but certainly for non-imaging stuff, the 3D printing can be quite useful. And we're gonna go back to this example uh, the yellow frame, that's a Fresnel lens, a Fresnel prism actually, and behind it are some LEDs, 
And the LEDs point straight ahead. And I wanted to cant the light in to the subject area. Uh, and I could have just tilted the LEDs on a circuit board. That, that would have made the circuit boards more expensive. Four little boards mounted at an angle. It was actually easier, cheaper to mount them flat and then cant the rays in with this little Fresnel prism. Now, the one on the left is a prototype. It was 3D printed, uh, again, about 17 years ago. When it was first printed, it was just as clear as the production unit on the right. Uh, one of the things you get with 3D printing, though, that keeps it from being good enough for imaging optics is it's rough. You can see that here, the one on the left, it's a little bit rough. The one on the right, which was injection molded the first time, it's nice and shiny. And that turned out to be a little problem, actually, because when we tried the first parts that were shiny in the camera, we had some stray light that we didn't have in the prototype. So I pulled up my part and I re-ran the model and this is out of Fred, I believe. And uh, to understand that the red rays are coming from an LED, and up at the top you see the triangles. Those are the triangles of the Fresnel prism. And I traced millions and millions more rays than I did the first time I modeled this. And then I turned on important sampling and ray splitting. And then I filtered out all the millions of rays that didn't hit the sensor. And this is what was left. So a couple dozen rays that through some total internal reflection and then some refraction came in hitting my lens, which is the gray thing. So that was that rectangular aspheric lens from the blue boxes, right? And that got into the sensor and it made flare, so that was bad. Well, I'd already had the tool made for this. I, wasn't, I could have recalculated all those prism angles and come up with something that didn't accidentally shine light into the sensor. Uh, but I didn't want to spend the money again on the tooling. But we knew the 3D part was rough and it didn't cause this problem. So I called the vendor and said, you know that nice tool you just made? That nice shiny tool? Can you lightly sandblast it please and make it a little rough? <laughs> because we knew that the uh, 3D printed part was a little rough and it didn't make the stray light, so they did that and then all the problems were, were solved. We didn't have stray light and we had beautiful conventional dark field when we wanted it and that special telecentric on axis dark field when we wanted that. In small, in fact, in all quantities, in small quantities and large, we can pitch polish. This is the oldest way to make a lens, right? I mean, you can do this yourself at home if you wanna spend a long time moving a pitch lap over a piece of glass it's mostly mechanized now, uh, but you can do this in one, you can do this in a thousand, you can do this in a million. Now, this is the conventional wisdom on pitch polishing, right? It starts off expensive, you only make one. Uh, it gets cheaper as you make more because you can block more lenses on the lap and amortize your efforts over a number of elements, especially if they're not too curved. Uh, and then at some point you gotta take a drastic step. Go to molded blanks, take a step down in cost, Maybe go to offshoring, it's another big step in cost. But some lenses, they never do that. They start off expensive and they stay expensive. An example of that would be a lens like this. This is a diffraction limited, high laser power, high aperture laser scan lens with an ultra flat field. This lens is as good as it can possibly be. It is built up one element at a time and a measurement is made, and then the next element is measured and custom spaced into it and so on till this near perfect lens is made. There's really no economies of scale making a lens that way. A lens like this costs tens of thousands of dollars. This is probably $30,000 lens, but it goes into a piece of capital equipment that will process silicon wafers that will cost about a million dollars. So. And the laser will be a couple hundred thousand dollars and some robots will be a couple hundred thousand dollars. So in the scheme of things, it's totally worth it. Going into the next set of quantities, at this point, you probably want to give up these catalog parts. You're paying a premium for the flexibility, for the adjustability. You have probably too many adjustments, more than you need. And it's time to have a mechanical engineer make something that's just right for your application 
and hopefully get all the adjustments onto one piece. Uh, but making a custom lens out of commercial, com uh, commercial elements is still a good idea in these quantities and even higher. Uh, diamond turned parts at this quantity, we already saw the crossover and, and the one example lens was 50 units. So 100 to 1,000, to you're not gonna make parts directly. But as a mold, it's a great technique. Depending on your selling price, 1,000 may be right. Uh, diamond turning is not the only way to make a mold. Uh, it's got the unique advantage that your prototype and your molded part are gonna have the same performance. Uh, but you can EDM, electro discharge machine parts, and they don't have to have any symmetry. You can see there's a little mouse optic. Uh, it's pretty cool because it controls both the laser and the imaging side, taking little pictures of your desktop, because uh, that's how a mouse navigates the desktop. It keeps taking pictures of your desktop and auto-correlating it. Uh, 3D printing is generally not cheap enough for this quantity. Again, you're gonna reach that crossover point in 100 to 1,000 where you're gonna to wanna to spend the money on a mold and amortize it instead of 3D printing every part one at a time. But pitch polishing is still great. Uh, it's still economical. I mean, up until recently, almost all of our camera lenses, Nikon, Canon, they were all pitched polish. Uh, but you might wanna do is go to molded blanks. So these are not very expensive. It's a simple pressing operation. So if you're making a very small quantity, you buy a block of glass, you cut it, you core drill it, you coarse grind it, you fine grind it, and you polish it. With the molded blank, you don't have to do the cutting, the core drilling, and the coarse polishing. You go right to fine polishing, uh, right to fine grinding and then polishing. So it's, it uh, quickly pays for itself and the labor saved. Our next tier, our next order magnitude, up to 10,000. Things get a little more interesting here, but you can still do a custom lens from stock elements. You can still pitch polish and probably with molded blanks, but you can also do something else you can do a net molded lens. And this is really cool because you're no longer constrained to spherical surfaces. So at the top is a little optical system made of spherical surfaces, probably pitch polished. But on the bottom is the same system made in A-spheres. And it's got the same performance in one element as two. Here's a lens I worked on recently. Uh, so we had two designs, one for our kind of proof of concept out of polished glass, all spherical surfaces, 12 elements, it was 40 millimeters long, had a crappy MTF at Nyquist. So Nyquist is when the spot is covering two pixels, 22%, barely good enough. It had some stray light issues, I'm not surprised, with 24 air glass interfaces. And it cost $40 a lens with 10K tooling. In molded A-spheres, less than half as many elements, almost half the total track length almost twice the contrast at Nyquist, and no stray light issues. With tooling at 40K and a cost of 25 per lens, the crossover for this lens was about 2,600 units. So clearly within our 1,000 to 10,000, we would cut over to the molded A-sphere design and not only save money, but hugely increase the performance. Uh, there's kind of a half step to going to molded, a molded glass A-spheres, and that's where you can take a spherical lens, probably pitched polished, and aspherize it with a very thin layer of polymer. Just take that spherical surface, and usually the departure from spherical in an A-sphere is not very big. So you can do it with a thin layer of polymer, and you get the advantage of glass, the thermal stability, the rigidity, the transparency, and you get the advantage of the A-sphere in getting a reduced number of elements or higher performance. This quantity in the photonic side, you should talk to your camera vendor or your sensor vendor. Uh, you may wanna do a semi-custom. Right? They have a sensor and a camera and board, but maybe you want a different shaped board for your product. Maybe you want optical isolation to harden it in a noisy environment. Maybe you wanna strip off some features to make it just the camera you need at less cost for you. So definitely engage your vendor and in the photonic side as well. Uh, on the optomechanical side, a good, a good opportunity for semi-custom. Maybe you have a zoom lens like this. You can get one with a higher mechanical tolerance if you're doing metrology, custom motors, maybe a different encoder, or maybe you take a two of them and put them in a custom, custom assembly 
or maybe a little stereo system like this, but mostly based on the standard part. Next tier of quantities up to 100,000. At this point, you're not going to do anything custom to the silicon. That takes a much higher number. But you can take the standard devices, you know, standard LED chips, standard Vixel chips, and work with a third party to put some custom secondary optics on those. So in the middle is a custom Vixel. That secondary optic, I think, creates a pattern of, of dots. And the other one's an LED on the far right. That's a secondary optic to make a certain size angular divergence with a high uniformity. On cameras, CIS, right, CMOS image sensor, an acronym of an acronym. They have a color filter array on them, typically. Now, some sensors are available monochrome out of the catalog, and some are available color. But a lot of sensors, the newest ones that are used in cell phones and stuff, the, the coolest, latest sensors with the highest performance, they're often only offered with this RGB color filter array. But that's a post-process. It's not part of the semiconductor processing. It's often done by a third party. And that's pretty simple. It's a small run. So depending on how large the wafer is and how large the device is, that means how many devices there are in the wafer, uh, you got this run of a small number of wafers, you can do a custom CFA. Maybe no color filter array to give you a monochrome sensor. Or maybe you figured out a different color filter array would be really good for your application. This is viable in these quantities. Similarly, uh, there's a micro lens array on top of the color filter array, usually. This is there for two reasons. One is it helps gather the light and concentrate it on the pixel for more efficiency. But the other reason it's there, it's usually offset a little bit to accommodate the chief ray angle. If we look at the two ray bundles coming in in the bottom. One's coming in at an angle at the, at the edge. The other one's coming straight down across. So we would say the one on the right has zero chief ray angle across the sensor. The one on the left has some function of chief ray angle increasing towards the edge of the chip. If the sensor you want has some chief ray angle that doesn't match your lens, you can talk to the sensor vendor. And they can deal with typically the third party that's doing this micro lens array for them. And number one, leave it off, that's easy. Just don't do the process. Now you have to buy a wafer's worth to do that, but a wafer's worth can be 10,000 or 20,000 depending on how big the imager is on the wafer. Or for a little more money, you might be able to do a slightly custom one where the offset's different and you can tune that CRA to match your optical system. Up to a million. This is fun. This is consumer electronics usually. But this is where things start to get fun. This is where you can dream big. Because whatever you think of, there's probably someone there willing to make it at that quantity. So here's the, I mean, you want to do an F2 five element molded plastic lens. This is a fraction limited lens. This is the kind of lens you see on consumer electronics, cell phones, tablets, uh, some video conferencing systems. This has a lot of investment to make, a lot of process to sort out. This becomes attractive in this you know, 100,000 to 1 million quantity. You won't get a vendor interested in smaller quantities. You can do a custom pixel and a custom sensor. And here's another little story. So I worked on the Fire Phone for Amazon and it had a unique 3D interface. The display was a standard. 2D LCD display, but we can manipulate that display to give a great illusion of 3D. But to do that, we had to know the position of the user's head. Actually, we know the position of their eyes, where they were looking at the screen from. Not only the angle, but also the distance. And that meant we needed two cameras looking at the user. And in fact, we ended up using four cameras because we didn't want the system to fail if they accidentally covered up one or two with their fingers or their thumbs. And we had to work at night, right? We can't, have, we can't have the user interface fail just because someone's reading in bed. So that meant I wanted a global shutter sensor. Now, a rolling shutter sensor is what most cameras are. Your front camera in your phone, your rear camera in your phone, your point and shoot camera, even your DSLR is probably a rolling shutter imager. And the rolling shutter imager, if you look at the left-hand image, 
every pixel is exposed and then read out pixel by pixel along the row and then row by row until the entire sensor is read out. So if you're illuminating this with an LED, regardless of what the exposure is, the exposure could be a millisecond. Sorry, the exposure could be a microsecond. You'd have to hold that light on for at least 10 milliseconds until the whole thing was read out. That's why when you take a picture with your cell phone, that little white LED is on for so long. It's waiting for that whole image to be exposed from top to bottom. The global shutter, on the other hand, it takes all of the pixels are exposed at once, and then they're read out. So the exposure and the readout are separate. So if you have to turn on the LED, you only have to turn it on for the length of the exposure. That can be orders of magnitude shorter. That means you can have orders of magnitude less current consumption, less heat, less drain on the battery. Or you can compress the same energy into that tiny exposure that all of the pixels are seeing at once and make a really bright image. Or you can balance those two, save some power and make a bright image. But the problem was, oh, sorry, there's one more advantage. You don't get this rolling shutter artifact. So because there's this time delay from top to bottom, if the subject's moving or the camera's moving, we had the camera in your hand, right? You could flick it in your wrist. And this is an actual picture of somebody, somebody's face being taken while they flick, flick the phone in their wrist. So we didn't have to deal with that either. So we had this one imager available to us that was globally shuttered at a six micron pixel. That meant at VGA, it was as big as the rear facing camera in the phone, which by the way is the tallest thing in a phone. It sets the thickness. There's no way they would let me add four of these to a cell phone. But I figured I could shrink that six micron pixel to a three micron pixel. That's a factor of four, because you're going from 36 square microns to nine square microns. This was a huge shrink. But at a million units, you can work with a vendor and you can do a custom pixel. And then you can make a custom camera from that pixel. I wasn't gonna do VGA just because VGA is a standard. I went back and looked at what we needed. So we needed 10 by 10 pixels at two meters and 20 by 20 pixels on a face at one meter for some really solid face tracking. And at our field of view of our lens, that meant we needed 360 by 360 pixels. So I rounded up because they didn't want to be on the ragged edge to 400 by 400. 0.16 megapixels. It doesn't sound like very much, but it's really just ideal for face tracking at these distances. And we had a little, this ended up being a tenth inch format versus a third inch, a tenth inch format. We made a custom little lens, little three element A sphere lens there with a field of view of 120 degrees at f2.4, which is, which is pretty efficient. We put it all together into a camera that was three millimeters on a side and three millimeters tall and we stuck it right to the front glass with a ring. And we put some little ribs on it so it couldn't rotate because this was part of a stereo system. And we couldn't have them moving around after we calibrated them. Still had one more problem. It's more on the photonic side, right? We had a application processor that had two inputs. Uh, single lane for the front facing camera, four lane for the rear facing camera. And here I wanted to add four more cameras to the system. So I stole two lanes from the rear facing camera. That turned out to be okay. It meant our top frame rate went from 30 frames per second to 27. We did some tests and no one could tell the difference between 27 and 30 frames per second, even imaging experts. So this was a good plan. We took two lanes, one became a clock, one became a data. And we still had four, four cameras, so stealing the lane didn't solve the problem completely. But we worked with our vendor to make a custom piece of silicon, a custom application specific circuit that took the four streams stitched them into one very long image that could then be sent on that single lane into the processor. So you're making a million of something, you can take just what you want and have it made into a circuit, an application-specific integrated circuit that's low power, small, and, and cheap, a couple bucks once, once the tooling's paid for, right? But at a million, the tooling's okay. Now there's one thing I found out that you can't do at even a million. That turns out to be a custom LED. Now you can custom package an LED, but if you want an actual custom device with you know, custom dye, the threshold for that is 10 million. And that's because the combination of the wafers being large and the devices being very, very tiny, 
and a single wafer yielding tens of thousands. No one's going to do all the work to make a custom wafer and just, just run a few of them. By the time you make it worthwhile, you're going to end up with tens of millions of these things. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Some thresholds for creating custom solutions. We just saw the custom LED at 10 million. Try this again. CMOS image sensor, about 1 million units. Custom packaged LED, maybe about 10,000. And a molded plastic lens, maybe 100. Custom glass lens, pitch polishing, maybe one unit, maybe 100 units. You can work with vendors to lower these limits. You can do semi-custom versus custom. We certainly did that with LEDs. So we didn't make 10 million, right? You can do non-exclusive licensing. So that little custom camera I made, some period of time after the phone was released, it appeared in the vendor's catalog. So they got the share and extra profits and helped mitigate the risk of taking that journey with us. You can do two versions. And we actually did that too. So there were some secret features on that camera on the version we got. On the version in the catalog, they're completely disabled. Of course, any time you do anything like this, you got, if you have a purchasing department, bring them in as soon as possible. If you have a legal department, especially bring them in as soon as possible. Thank you very much. I can take some questions now.